Good evening, First Baptist Church, to all of our members and friends uh, near and far. We want to thank you for joining us for another Bible study night. Uh, we hope this uh, Bible study will be informative and uh, that we can uh, be able to apply this lesson and be careful uh, with the subject matter. Uh, again, we want to thank all of you for uh, linking on. And having said that, let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your ever-loving kindness. We pray you continue to bless us, continue to keep us, watch over us, go before us and come behind us. Lord, we're asking that you continue to teach us your word because Lord, this lesson is in your word. And so Father, we just want to make sure that as followers of Jesus Christ, that we uh, observe the pitfalls uh, along the way, that we observe those things, Lord, that can put us in a snare and then, Lord, calls us to act ungodly. So we're just praying, Father, that you would bless the hearers tonight. And we're praying, Father, that you would just help us along this life's journey. We know, Lord, that the enemy is busy. And we are praying, Father, that you keep us strong and keep us vigilant and help us to continue to know your word, Lord, so that when we enter into spiritual warfare, uh, uh, Lord, that we'll know how to apply your word and be successful uh, as we come through these uh, spiritual battles. We're praying for the sick among us. We're praying for the bereaved among us. And we ask the Lord that you continue to watch over us and remember, Lord, your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, so me that you brought me from. 
Sister Walker, uh, for that beautiful, beautiful song. One of those old songs that really touches our hearts. We want to thank you, Sister Walker, for that beautiful, beautiful selection. We want to continue our uh, subject on the danger of envy and jealousy. The danger of envy and jealousy. Our introduction says, the sin that rarely gets discussed, but is very dangerous in communities, churches, and society is envy and jealousy. There is a fine line between envy and jealousy. Envy is desiring to have what belongs to someone else. For example, it could be material items, a person, natural or spiritual gifts, positions, recognition, visibility, etc. These are describing covetousness. Jealousy is almost the same with a slight twist. It is the protection of what already belongs to a person when someone else wants it. For example, you can envy someone else for her husband, but someone flirting with the husband makes her jealous, not envious, because the husband is already hers. The Bible tells us that God is a jealous God in that loyalty, praise, and worship belong exclusively to him alone. And we find that in Exodus 20 and 5. Why? Because God has made us and not we ourselves. So whether there is a fine line between envy and jealousy, the fact remains it causes trouble in the camp. It causes trouble in the church. It causes trouble in the community. It causes trouble in the job setting, et cetera. It is dangerous when we allow it to take over our hearts and minds. It is instigated by Satan, the devil, to keep trouble, strife, division, and evil practices going to prevent the advancing of God's kingdom on earth. So let us be careful about envy and jealousy because it can be dangerous and destructive. We want to continue our subject on that because, again, very rarely do you hear sermons about it. Very rarely do you hear teachings on it. And if the body of Christ is going to get strong if the body of Christ is going to unify, if the body of Christ is going to champion uh, the cause of the kingdom of God, then we're going to have to deal with these uh, envies and jealousies that we have uh, in the body of Christ, in society, maybe in our homes and among our siblings. Uh, the Bible is saturated uh, with this kind of situation and circumstances of jealousy and envy. So in order for us to guard against that, because anytime God starts to bless a church, starts to bless an individual, starts to bless a family, you name it, uh, the enemy is there uh, to wave that emotion, to wave the emotion of envy and jealousy. As I said last week, uh, we all have it, but we just have to be careful with it because we even know that God has it. And God has it because what? He made us and not we ourselves. And he does not want us to bow down to other gods. He does not want us to give our attention and our worship and our praise toward anybody else but him because he is uh, the cause of our lives. He is the cause of our blessings. He's the cause of everything about us. So it belongs exclusively to God and not to uh, anybody or anything else. And this is why God said in his word through Moses to the children of Israel, I am a jealous God. 
I don't want you running after other gods. I don't want you bowing down to other gods. I don't want you having affections and 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 and, and, a, and embracing of that which is not toward me. So again, as I said, uh, as as a husband and wife, they're supposed to be one. They're supposed to love each other. But if you see husband and wife rendezvousing with somebody outside of that marriage, that's going to cause a lot of jealousy. And then that jealousy can lead to Lord knows what any any kind of crime. So we have to be careful with that because the enemy is out to do what? To kill, steal, and to destroy. All right, we're going to move on to our, our scriptures tonight. And this one, first one, will be read by Deacon Benjamin Hundley. And we're going to be reading Numbers 6, 8 through 10. And the reason why I give you these scriptures because I want you to understand that we are no different than the people that we're reading about in scripture. All right, Deacon Benjamin Huntley. Then Moses said to Korah, hear now you sons of Levi, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself? to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to serve them and that he has brought you near to himself. You and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Hmm, thank you, uh, uh, Deacon Hunley for reading us the scripture. And here we know Moses was leading a large congregation. Uh, he had to deal, Moses had to deal with a lot of rebellion. He had to deal with a lot of envy and jealousy of people. And uh, Moses had to constantly pray. And here he was up against uh, Korah. Uh, Korah uh, was a person who God had selected uh, to to serve uh, the people. Uh, and he said to Korah, now, is it a small thing that, 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 that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord? So in other words, Moses was telling Korah, you just a person not satisfied in your position. Uh, you uh, have been selected to work uh, in the tabernacle of the Lord. The Lord has singled you out to work there. And he has singled you out to serve the people, to stand before the congregation and to serve them. That is your ministry, okay? And uh, and he's brought you near to himself, more than he's done others. And you and all your brothers, the sons of Levi with you. And now you are seeking the priesthood also. So we find out that Korah and the sons of Levi were envying the position of priesthood because uh, serving uh, and doing the work of the tabernacle was not good, uh, uh, not satisfying for them. It didn't stroke their ego enough. It didn't make them feel big enough. Uh, maybe it didn't give them the visibility they wanted, but whatever the reason was, it was not good enough for Korah. And he was creating a lot of confusion he was creating a lot of rebellion in the congregation, and, uh, and he wanted something that God had not given him. He wanted a ministry that God had not uh, uh, authorized him to be in. He wanted that priesthood. And there are some people in the church uh, who want to be pastors. They think they want to be pastors. When they actually become a pastor and know what a pastor has to go through behind the scenes, they might want to jump back over and become what they were before. Uh, uh, but 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 God places us where God wants us to be at that particular time. And so maybe if he had a serve with graciousness, with faithfulness uh, uh, and godliness and, and, and things like that, maybe God would have promoted him to the priesthood. But at this particular time, uh, he uh, was trying to uh, get there himself along with the sons of, of Levi. So therefore, Moses calls 
uh, uh, call them into question about that. Moses said, now, you know, the Lord did this for you to stand before the congregation to serve them and that he's brought you near to himself, you and your brothers and the sons of Levi with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Moses knew that the confusion that they were calling, they were seeking the priesthood. It was a position of visibility. It was a position uh, uh, of authority. It was a position higher than just in the tabernacle. So Korah said, uh-uh, I want the priesthood. So he ended, he ended that position. He wanted it. And he was willing to do whatever was necessary to get it. And a lot of times people are willing to fight God to get where they want to go. Now, if we get to the point where we want to fight God in his order, we're going to lose. We're going to definitely lose. And even if you get there, who's to say the death won't be waiting uh, to take you out of here? So it was that Korah overstepped his authority. He overstepped his uh, uh, authority in that he wanted to be in a position that he was not uh, gifted to be in. He was not authorized to be in, but yet he ended, to, he ended that position. And we have a lot of people like that today in the postmodern church. We have a lot of people like that, even in uh, uh, the workforce. If you have a position, there are other people want your position because they feel like, well, I got more education uh, than that person. Or I've been doing this and got more experience than that person. So, but, the, but you are in the position. And for some reason, they envy that because you are in that position and they are not. And they will get to working to undermine you. They will get to working uh, to make sure that they make you look bad. They will get to working because what? Because they envy you being in that position. So again, if we are envying positions and the persons who are in those positions, uh, many a times that will drive people to do things that they normally wouldn't do because that emotion is working overtime inside of them. And then if you couple couple that with Satan's influence, uh, then what you're gonna have is a recipe for disaster because the enemy is going to lead you to do things that you normally wouldn't do, but he gonna always, he gonna always try to push you uh, to do things in order to get rid of that person so you can be in that position. We find that in every, in every profession. So. What I'm talking about is not new. This scripture here has contemporary relevance, not just ancient relevance, it has contemporary relevance, not just in the church, in the workplace, you name it. Somebody want your position, somebody want to be where you are, and they will work overtime to undermine you, to make you look bad uh, so that they can have that position. And they will join crowds, negative crowds, to get you out of there. So again, Moses was calling into question the motive, the motive of Korah. He saw right through it. And he told him, said, now the Lord has separated you. He's given you a job to do, but that's not good enough for you. That's not satisfying enough for you. So the question is, who are you doing this for? If it's for the Lord, then you ought to be working to please the Lord and not yourself. But you're not doing this for the Lord. You're doing it for yourself. This is why this position uh, is not good enough for you. It doesn't bring you the type of recognition you want or the visibility you want. And this is why you are taking a turn uh, of becoming rebellion against the order of God, against the things of God, and against the leader of God. So, and he said that you brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of L Levi with you, and are you seeking the priesthood also? Moses knew that they were seeking a, pos a higher position of authority. And they ended that. Korah and the sons of Levi, they ended that because they felt like, I need to be there. I need to be in this position. And we have people like that today. And this is one reason why I'm saying that if churches and uh, congregations, if they don't watch out, uh, they're going to be marred with a lot of envying and jealousy. And the Bible did say where there's envying and, 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 and jealousy, that is the work of all evil, okay? 
So we have to be careful because the enemy is always, he's always working. And this is why I'm teaching this lesson because we all have to look within ourselves and say to ourselves, what is my motive? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I doing it to please myself? Am I doing it to bring recognition to myself? Am I doing it uh, because it's, it's a position or something I desire? I need that attention. I need that visibility. Why am I doing it? And if we're not doing it for Christ, if we're not doing it for the kingdom of God, we are a prime target for the devil because he's going to come in and he's going to keep reminding you that you should have that position. You should do that. You the one got the education. A lot of time it's not about the education. It's about who the Lord selects to do his work. Yes, education will aid. But with education, you got to have the character. You have to have the, the demeanor. You have to have the temperance. You got to know how to work with people. Okay? Uh, sometimes, as I said before, many years ago at First Baptist, I said, sometimes, you know, a stupid devil goes in to get education. He just comes out to be a clever devil. So it's not just about the education. It's about our, our relationship with, with God through Jesus Christ. And we have to always check our motives because I'm telling you, if our motive is not to praise God, and to glorify God through our gifts, our positions, and our titles, we are a prime suspect for the enemy to come in and use us in order to cause confusion uh, in the congregation or in the workplace, in many times, in the marriage, or even in, in your own families. So again, this is a very volatile uh, 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 emotion that we have to, we have to be uh, careful about. All right, let's move on. All right, watch this video that will give us a uh, food for thought. Hello, beautiful souls. It's your girl, Dara from Cups and Conversations, coming to you today to talk to you about these words. And these words are jealousy and envy. Jealousy and envy. I know that we use them interchangeably a lot of times and um, they're similar, but when you think about jealousy, it comes with a bitterness. It comes with um, hostility. Um, it brings some nasty stuff where envy a lot of times people are like, oh, you got that position, oh, I'm so envious of you. Or, oh, you got a husband that cares about you. I'm so envious, oh my, your wife is beautiful. I'm so envious, you know. It's not a lot of hostility when it comes with the envy. I'm not saying that it can't go there, but envy, jealousy, whichever one is um, shaking you up or is uh, on your back, it's walking around with you, that's making you feel like you don't have what someone else has. It's okay to see someone else's life and say, oh goodness, now I like that, or that's a characteristic that I would like to have, or I like your car, or hey, your house is beautiful. The thing is, don't get so caught up on what you see on the outside of a person or a relationship that you don't appreciate what you have going on in your own life. Sometimes we want what someone else has so bad, but we do not understand their story. We do not understand what it is that it took for them to get what they have. Are you really ready to go through all those things just to get what looks like is a beautiful thing? You know, people look at other people's relationships and they grow jealous, but you don't know the trials and tribulations that that relationship had to go through to get where they are. You see people with money and nice cars. You don't know what they do for a living. You don't know what their job entails, how hard it may be that you're like, oh, yeah, no, I don't want to do that. So instead of focusing on what someone else has compared to what you don't if you want it figure out a way to get it just like they did figure out a way to get it if you want it you know again the door is not closed for you if there's something that you want to do better at or something that 
you want to get your hands on or a skill or a characteristic that someone else has, instead of looking at them, standing back and looking at them and being judgmental or becoming jealous or envious, ask the questions, hey, how'd you get that? You know, hey, how'd y'all meet? Oh, what did you say? Or how'd you get that position? Ask the questions. That's the way that you find out how you need to do it or how not to do it. But yet and still, let's not grow jealous of each other or become envious of each other. Let's grow in skills of communication, awareness, and understanding where we can approach each other and ask the necessary questions. So if it's something that you do, not, if you something that you do want and you don't have yet, keyword yet, there is still time for you to get it. Formulate a plan, make it happen. Love yourself. Love yourself, and all of the love is but a bonus. Make it a phenomenal day. Amen, amen. What, what a video. I mean, she really put that thing in perspective to talk about that envy and jealousy. We don't have to be. Now, let me explain this. Um. When people have natural or spiritual gifts, that's that's given by God. There's nothing you can do uh, to get a similar gift like that. Uh, point in case, uh, I may not be able to sing like Nat King Cole. That's just a natural spiritual gift that God has given him. So therefore, there's no use of me being envious and jealous uh, over a natural or spiritual gift because there's nothing I can do to get it, okay? So again, I can't cut his head open or cut his body open and, and that gift will get into me. That's ridiculous. So it is ridiculous to try to envy or be envious and jealous over someone that has a God-given gift or talent. Uh, you just look within yourself and myself and we see what God has given us because just like you looking at someone else with their natural and spiritual gift, when you look really in your, in your own life, you have a spiritual and natural gift too that the other person doesn't have. But again, the devil always leads us into comparing. We got to compare ourselves to someone else. And when we compare ourselves to someone else, that's where we get into, into trouble. And when that trouble comes, that's when the enemy comes to, to fan that even more, okay? And people get envious just because that person's gift or talent uh, has brought them a, a, a lot of notoriety, a lot of visibility, maybe a lot of wealth. Well, someone else that can sing probably just as good or maybe not just as good, they go to comparing. Well, I can sing just as better. Or I can preach as good. Uh, 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 I can do this. As... Stop doing that. Don't do yourself like that. Because when you start doing that, the devil is going to lead you into the bitterness and a lot of the nasty stuff that you don't want to be in. Now, she said that when you're looking at material things like a car or a house or something, listen, I is no use of me trying to envy someone who is able to pay for a $12 million mansion. Okay, first of all, I don't need that big house. Second of all, I don't have the money to buy that big house. Third of all, there's no use of me being envious over that because of what? Because I don't have the financial uh, uh, means in order to purchase that. And even if I did have the financial means, I probably still wouldn't do it because, you know, too much house uh, 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 it does not serve you well other than the fact that it's just a trophy for you, I guess. I don't know. But if it's something that you cannot afford, why are you going to envy somebody that can't afford it? Okay, so it's no use of me getting envious over entertainers who are making uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars a year or have a hundred million dollar contract that able to buy the latest car uh, the latest mansion or whatever their money is able to do. No use of me getting envious over that because I cannot do that. But what I can say is I'm also blessed because I do have a roof over my head. 
I'm also blessed because I do have a car to ride. May not be as luxurious and it may not be as new and have all of the latest technology in it, but it gets me from point A to point Z. That's the thing we ought to be looking at. Look at what we are, look at what we do have and how God has blessed us. And then when you start looking at the third world countries, when you start looking at the third world countries and you start looking at what you have, you're going to say, Lord, I am, I am truly blessed. That ought to make you want to take your hand and put it over your mouth and say, Lord, forgive me for envying what someone else has and looking at what I'm blessed with and then looking at the third world countries where they don't even have enough food to eat. That ought to make you want to put your hand over your mouth and say, Lord, forgive me. But that's what people do. That's what people do. They go to comparing. They go to, how did she get that? Or they go to talking about, how did you get that position and all like that? Listen, God is no respective person. Uh, we often sing, what he's done for others, he'll also do for you. But the question is, do you really need a, a, a 14 house mansion? Do you really need a Rolls Royce? Do you really need this, that, and other that you think you want? A lot of times we get these things and then we find out how difficult it is to maintain them. Then we want to give it back. So a lot of times God knows what we can handle. God knows uh, 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 how we can handle certain things and handle certain people and certain positions. There's some people who envy certain positions. But the question is, can you handle, if you can't do too much with 200 people, why are you going to envy someone that got 30,000 people? Y'all see what I'm talking about? So you got, God blesses you according to your ability. If you can't handle 200, what you going to do with 30,000 or 40,000 or 10,000? Sometimes we just want something just because someone else has it, but we don't have the skills. We don't have uh, uh, what it takes in order to maintain it. So when God gives us something, he gives us something that he knows we can handle, something he knows that can bring him glory if we use it right. Just like he gave Korah. He gave them something that they can handle, but it wasn't good enough. Now, I want the priesthood. You can't handle the priesthood right now. You know, Maybe you can grow into it, but you can't handle that right now. And you may never grow into it. I don't know. But just because you're on one level does not mean that you can't be blessed to go to the next level. But you got to show humbleness. You got to show appreciation. And you have to show uh, faithfulness on the level that you are on. Again, God positions us where God needs us. And if it is a time for us to be promoted, God knows how to do that. But there is no need for us going after something that is not in God's will for us. That's why I often pray, Lord, regardless of my desires, keep me in your will because you know what I can handle and you know what I cannot handle. And I prefer to stay in your will so that I won't become an embarrassment to you and an embarrassment to myself. So we have to be careful of what we are running after. We have to be careful of what we are desiring. We have to be careful because that envy and that jealousy is right there to pounce upon you and to get you to do things, think things, say things that will get you in some, in some, into some spiritual trouble. So again, and it also, it'll also cause you, if you see somebody else, with gifts and talents, those, that person, you go to fighting against them because you're now trying to protect your little position. You're trying to protect what you think belongs to you. It's, it's amazing to me how people, when new people come in and they have gifts and talents that can edify the body, other people start protecting what they think belongs to, to them or uh, him or her. And they, 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 they'll fight to stay there because they're fighting someone else that they think has a better gift or can sing better, preach better, teach better. So they're going to do what? They're going to fight because they want to stay where they are. And we're going to see this later on in our scriptures. It's a human, it's a human drama. It's a human experience that we got to be careful about. 
we definitely got to be careful about. All right, let's move on. And this one shall be read by Deaconess Karen Wright. Let's see, Deaconess Wright, you can unmute yourself. Oh, you go okay. ahead. I'm fine. I did it. I'm sorry. No problem. Um, first Samuel's 18, 5 through 12. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the woman had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David 10,000 and to me, they have ascribed only a thousand. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul I David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand and Saul cast a spear for he said, I will pin David to the wall, but David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Thank you, Deaconess Wright, for reading us this scripture. This is a prime example of what I just said before. Now, Saul knew that David was some special because this was before, uh, this incident was before or after uh, Saul, uh, David had went and killed the giant. And after David killed the giant, uh, David was called to be in Saul's army. Okay, and I'm sure that there were people speaking well of David, this young man, he going before uh, a, a giant and nobody else could bring him down. And he he was brave enough to go and stand before him and and with and, and with a slingshot in his hand, uh, he was able to bring this giant down and cut his head off. And I'm sure that was a lot of of, of compliments to David, I'm sure. And, and, and I'm sure also that Saul was earshot of all of those compliments. I'm sure he was. So uh, 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 Saul invited him to be part of his army. So David went out wherever Saul sent him. And here's the thing, and he behaved wisely. That's what we got to do. We got to behave wisely, regardless of what coming against us or who says what about us, we have to learn how to behave wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. See, this just this didn't just happen overnight. This was cumulative. People were uh, probably applauding David. Uh, uh, David. They were probably uh, complimenting him uh, on, uh, uh, about his victory o o over uh, um, the giant Goliath. And it says, now it had happened as they were coming home. You remember, they, they were in a war. He was sending them out to fight in these wars. Now, as it happened, as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter, he was in a war. He, what, returning home from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women that the women came out of all the cities of Israel. What were they doing? They were singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tangerines, with uh, joy, musical instruments. And so the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Now I want you to put yourself in Saul's mindset right now. Put, your, put yourself in Saul's mindset. Here's a young snapper that has just joined my army. He has behaved wisely. 
he has uh, 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 slaughtered a lot of the Philistines. And now we're coming home. I'm the king. I'm Saul. But yet the women of all the cities are giving David more praise, more adoration, more thanksgiving, uh, giving him more than me. And I supposed to be the king. Think about that. So the women sang as they danced, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Right there, Saul became jealous. Right there, Saul became angry. Right there, the spirit of bitterness. Like I said, we have to watch that jealousy because it would lead us to do some crazy things. It is an emotion. And if we don't control that emotion, we can get violent with it and it can lead us to, to, to taking somebody's life. So it says, that, and then Saul was very angry. Why? Because what? The women were striving to David more than they were striving to King Saul. And what they were saying, it displeased him. And he said, they have a stride to David 10,000. And to me, they have a, a stride only thousands. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? Think about that now. If they have that kind of adoration uh, and, and, and praise for David, what more uh, can he have but my kingdom? And another translation would say, so David uh, so saw I, David, uh, from that day forward. Another translation would say, and he, what, he was jealous of David from that day forward. And so being jealous of David, uh, uh, and God, because God had already fired, God had already fired Saul. Sometimes God can fire people and then leave them in place. Because David was not yet ready to take the throne. David was not mature enough. He probably even didn't have it in his head. Uh, that he was going to take the throne. He was just so happy to be able to serve his king. He was happy to be able to pull down this giant that was uh, uh, in the way uh, 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 of Israel. So he, he was just being happy to serve. But think about because God was with him, God was working through him, God was giving him victory over his enemies, Saul became very Jealous of David. And the 10th verse said, and it happened on the next day that a distressing spirit from God came upon David. Now, other translation would say uh, an evil spirit came upon David. But whatever it was, it vexed him and it came from God. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. And he prophesied inside the house. So any time that this spirit would come upon Saul, uh, it, it would vex him. And he was probably, uh, uh, it caused him discomfort and he couldn't sleep. It, 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 just, it just didn't make him feel at peace and comfortable. So David would play for him. David was a harp player. So David played music with his hand as he did other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand. And because Saul could not control that spirit, that spirit of jealousy in him, Saul cast a spear at the very man that he felt like was supplanting him. He, 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 he cast a spear at David that he felt like was now trying to take his, take his kingdom. He cast a spear at the very man that they had a strive 10,000 and only gave him thousands. So that spirit now of jealousy is working in him. Now he's trying to do what? He's trying to destroy the source of his jealousy. And we have people like that in the church. If we don't watch it, nothing that someone does, if, 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 if a person is our object of jealousy, whatever that person does is not good enough. Because we're going to talk against that person. We're going to do everything we can to do what? To undermine that person because now that person is the object of our envy and our jealousy. And I don't care what they do. I don't care how well they do it. 
is not good enough because that jealousy is now working and is now turning into bitterness. And so when that spirit got into Saul and it began to turn into bitterness, what did he do? He cast a spear and he said, for I will pin David to the wall. In other words, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to take him out of here. I'm going to destroy him. That's that jealousy operating. It wants to kill somebody. That's that spirit. And we got to be careful because I'm telling you, it will just like if, 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 if a boyfriend and a girlfriend, well, if, if the girlfriend goes uh, with another boy somewhere, that boyfriend that was supposed to be with her, he might get so filled with, with jealousy over his supposed to be girlfriend. Now, she may have broken up with him. I don't know. But he may get so filled with jealousy that that jealousy immediately might turn into bitterness. So much so that he might try to go and, and destroy the girl. He might try to go and kill her. And in many cases, uh, we find out that boyfriends have killed girlfriends. They call that uh, uh, the crime of passion. The crime of passion. All they're talking about is the crime of jealousy. And if you and I don't get a hold of that jealousy or that envy, the devil is going to have a heyday on us. It's a spirit, and we got, to, we got to dislodge it out of our hearts. We got to dislodge it out of our minds, or it's going to cause us to do some very ungodly things. So Saul, Saul cast his spear. He cast his spear at David and said, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to pin him to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. This is the second time he's done this. Now, how am I supposed to feel or how David's supposed to feel that here I am trying to serve my king, trying to serve my nation, but my king is trying to destroy me. My supervisor trying to destroy me. The person over me is trying to take me out of here. How am I supposed to handle this? For it said, but David escaped his presence twice. The Lord was with David. And then verse 12 says, and Saul was afraid of David because what? The Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. And that's why we have, when we talk about spiritual warfare, there are opposing spirits, even in the church. God's spirit can be in a few of us, but the devil's spirit can be in other of us. And when we got God's spirit and the devil's spirit, in us and in one congregation, that's a recipe for what? Disaster. That's that's a recipe for non-growth. That's a recipe for bickering and fighting and, 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 and undermining one another. And a church can stay like this and a spirit can be in them and over them like this for years. And they wonder why they can't grow. And this is why we talk about what is the health of the church. In order to have the growth of the church, you first got to have the health of the church. And the health of the church is not healthy. When you have a whole lot of people who have envy and jealous spirits in the house of God among their brothers and sisters. And anytime we are gossiping, anytime we are trying to undermine one another, pull one another down, your church can't grow. We can't grow as a church family. And this is why I'm saying that we have to always, that's why the Bible said, put on the whole arm of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, or put it on because you're going to need it because the opposing spirit is always trying to what? To, 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 to destroy, always trying to divide and destroy. And so we see that these two spirits, David was trying to calm Saul down and Saul was trying to kill David. Those things go on almost every day. Now, we may not, we may not grab a, a, a sword and throw it at the person. But when you're throwing accusations out, when you're throwing uh, gossip out, when you're throwing untruths out, when you're doing things against people and you have no basis for it, that's just like throwing a, a, a dagger or throwing a spear at that person to, to destroy that person because now that person is the object of your jealousy. And this is why I'm bringing this lesson up, not just in our church, it's in every church. 
and you have to be careful. And let me also say about praise. When praise goes toward one person or two persons, sometimes you got to be careful. You got to be careful because people love praise. The devil loves praise. God loves praise. So quite naturally, we going to love praise. But when you praise somebody too much, it could easily go to his or her head. It can easily become something that that person seeks rather than glorifying God. I heard Martin Luther King Jr. say, the only thing about praise is when it goes towards somebody else too much. So again, they praise David. They praised him. They have strived to him 10,000. Only saw the thousand. Saul began to do what? Make comparison. And then he started saying, well, if they feel that way about him, they might want him to be the king. Maybe that's what he's trying to do. Maybe that's why he, want, he wants my throne. It's not for David to want your throne. God had already fired you, and God is preparing David to take the throne. But this was not the time for David to take the throne. David was just trying to serve his king, but, but jealousy was moving Saul to kill the boy or to kill the young man. And we have the same thing going on in the church. So as God's people, as God's servants, we have to be extremely, extremely careful. All right, let's move on. All right, our discussion. Do you think that jealousy and envy are a result of feeling insecure, invisible, or unappreciated? If so, why do you think that these feelings can cause such jealousy, and envy. Think about that a minute and put your answers in the chat. Let's talk about it. Do you think that jealousy and envy are the result of feeling insecure, invisible, or unappreciated? If so, why do you think that these feelings can cause such jealousy or envy? Sometimes we find that even among children. Give too much attention to one child and not enough to another child, that in itself will cause jealousy. Okay? So we have to be careful. We have to act just like God. Be wise and behave wisely. So what you think about it? Talk to me. Put it in the chat. Think about it. Let's go over this. Anything in the chat? Any comments? Well, y'all got it, huh? All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm. I'm. I, am I? Am, am, am I telling the truth? Well, maybe, 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 am I telling the truth on this? Not just in the church, workplace, government, you name it. Wherever there are human beings, you probably gonna have that. Even family. You have family members fighting over one of them. Oh, I think mother loves her more than they love me. I think daddy loves... Think about Joseph. That's a prime example. Last week, we talked about Joseph. How when Jacob gave him a coat of many colors, look how that caused a uh, 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 jealousy in the other brothers. That's a family matter. Okay? That's a family matter. All right, no, no other comments? Okay. Oh, I got one, 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 one comment in the chat box. Oh, you, okay, and you got one hand up. We got Deacon James, and then I'll read the chat. All right, uh, go, go ahead, ahead Deacon, Deacon James. James. Um, Pastor Davis, um, uh, jealousy sometimes happens in the family unaware. Uh, I'm the oldest of nine children. My brother went to Vietnam. He was a paratrooper, and when he came back. Uh, all he could remind me was that he had been in service and he was a paratrooper. And that thing kind of got to me a little bit because I'm the oldest of all of them. He done went and served. He's a paratrooper. But I was proud of him. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at that, I was proud of him that he was able to do that. But sometimes it can happen in the family without knowing jealousy because the devil would do that to you and yes. he would play but being in the church and knowing a little bit I was proud of him and the spirit of the Lord just led me and eventually we was able to walk together in life 
Amen. It can happen. It can happen. I, I, I ain't going to tell you who it is, but we, we can even have mothers who treat their children better if they're light-skinned over the dark-skinned children. I mean, I've heard it all. I mean, it's, it's, it can be a family issue. It can be a church issue. It can be a friend issue. You know, we have to learn how to talk about this, and we have to learn to call it for what it is if we're going to overcome it. All right. In the chat. Two things in the chat. One said some people don't like what someone else has or et cetera. And then the other one is, I think that jealousy and envy both stem from a lack of faith in God and his goodness. If we truly trusted God, we would not worry about what gifts he has bestowed upon others. Amen. 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 Again, uh, all of us have been given something. Now, I wish I could. I wish I could preach like Reverend C.L. Franklin. That's that's my favorite preacher. Uh, uh, in case you all don't know who he is, that is Aretha Franklin's father. Go back and look, listen at some of his old. I wish I could preach like that. I wish I could move a crowd like that, but I can't. I can only do what God gave me to do. Uh, some people wish they could sing like uh, Aretha Franklin, you know, but you sing with what the Lord has given you. I wish I had a voice like Nat Brown, but I don't. But I have to do what? I have to sing with the voice I have. I wish I could sing like Dick and Aaron Butler. And, all, and many of you, I just don't have it. So what, what do I do? I do what he's given me to do. I preach the way he's given me to preach. And everybody has to do what the Lord has called him or her to do and not make comparison because every gift that's given to us it should be used to the glory of God. Amen. Now, I don't desire to be the president of the United States. Very visible position. Get a lot of attention. But Lord have mercy. Can you go 24-7? Can you be uh, in meetings all day, flying here and flying there? You got to make decisions about this. Make, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. Your whole life is an open book. If you go to the bathroom, somebody going to say he went in the bathroom, he may have fallen in the bathroom. Just your whole life is an open book. Do you want that kind of life? No. And just like we said earlier, that, you know, we you can envy what someone else wants, but you don't know what they went through to get it. I heard Reverend uh, um, uh, 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 Davis, what's his name? Quincy. Reverend Quincy Davis said one time, he said, you might see my glory, but you don't know my story. You don't know what I had to go through. You don't know the, 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 the sleepless nights. You don't know the time I had to cry. You don't know uh, uh, I worried this. You don't know the many times I had to go without eating. It's a whole lot. We don't. It's just like I told my daughter, Nandy. I said, the world is positioned that they don't want to hear about your struggles. They could care less about what it took for you to get there. All thing they want to know when you get to the top of the mountain, that's the only thing they're concerned about. That's the way the world works. They don't want to hear about all that other stuff. You got to the top of the mountain of what you wanted to achieve, and that's what the world going to go on. Put worrying about the process. Nobody concerned about that. They just want to look and see you made it. So again, we got to, we have to make sure that we, 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 we use that emotion. And if that emotion is very destructive or can be very destructive, we need to ask God to remove us and, and, and remove that emotion from us. I saw another uh, chat, uh, a comment coming to the chat. Okay, the other one says, everything that we own owns us right on back. Nothing we have exists in of itself. There's a hidden cost in owning anything, and often this cost is our limited time and energy. Time and energy that could be better spent on family, friends, and service to the church and our community. Amen to that. Amen. Absolutely. And I can even go further. I, I, I told my wife, and then we're going to close. When Deacon Benjamin Hundley first joined the church, y'all know I used to call on her to sing them old Dr. Watts. And boy, he used to sing them songs, boy. But I heard something and I said, no, I ain't gonna put him on the spot anymore because I didn't want, I did not want a fan 
anything in the congregation. So I don't call you no more, Deacon. <laughs> but he just had an old knack for old songs, old hymns, old uh, metered hymns and stuff like that. So, you know, but it was it's a gift to edify the body. If you hadn't heard it before, it was a gift. Reverend Grace can sing very well. I love to hear her sing uh, uh, whatever that song was. I forget it now. But I love to hear her sing that. I mean, it's just we have these gifts and talents. I'm more thinking about edifying the body of Christ than I am about giving praise to the person who has the gift to do that, if y'all know what I mean. It's just like I tell Brother Fox. It's just like I tell the choir, you know. I want, the period, I want the people to feel the Holy Spirit and grab one of them old songs that you know we know and sing them to your ability so that the Holy Spirit can come in. Now, once the Holy Spirit come in, that's what you want because it starts to do the ministry. It starts to cut the what? Uh, 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 cut the chains and cutting the yokes and whatever people, whatever people stand in need of, the Holy Spirit is now there to do exactly what the Holy Spirit needs to do because it knows what we need. That's why I, I want us to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And if you got the gift, if you got the talent, whatever you got, let's, let's employ it. Let's bring it forth so that that spirit can come in. Amen. All right. Uh, we're going to pick this up next week. All right. So let us continue. Uh, to do some self-evaluation with this thing because you see how Saul became toward David. The question is, do you think that that is happening in the postmodern church? Of course it is happening. It's happening in the preaching, in the singing, in ushering. You, you just name it, it happens because that enemy does not care. He going to go around the church and he going to find somebody vulnerable and he going to get in them. And if they don't watch it, he's going to use that emotions against somebody. So we just got to be careful. Amen. Amen. All right. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to thank you for this lesson. We want to thank you, Lord, for the grace and the mercy that you have extended toward us. And Lord, thank you for putting this on my heart to teach this lesson because we are all your children. And you have given us all a spiritual gift. Some you gave one, some you gave three, some you've given five. But whatever you have given us, you want us to use those gifts and those talents, Lord, to bring glory to your name. You want us to use those gifts and those talents, Lord, to edify the body of Christ, Lord, so that we can be inspired to go on and do the work of the kingdom. You, you have given us what we need. Lord, help us not to have a heart of envy and jealous, jealousy because, Father, we know Lord, that that works to the hands of the enemy. We know, Father, that that can create a lot of bitterness. We know, Father, that that can create a lot of rebellion and a, not, a lot of non-unity. And, Father, we want to unify. We want to we wanna, we wanna come together, Lord, so that, that we can let our light shine, so that others can see our good work, and they, too, want to glorify the Father which is in heaven. So, Father, help us, because we recognize that we're not the only one with the gifts. We're not the only one with the talents. We're not the only ones, Lord, that you have blessed, Lord, with, with the gift or natural and spiritual gift in order, Lord, to bless your people. But help us, Lord, to understand that whatever you have given us, you've given it us to us for us to use, Lord, for the kingdom. And, Lord, when we stand before you, Lord, you're not going to do any comparison as to what you gave us versus what you gave somebody else. Lord, you're going to judge us on what did we do with what you've given us. Just like with the with the with the with the with, with the men with the talents, one had five, one had three, and one had one. And just because the one had one, he buried it. He did not use it. He did not glorify you with it. He did not edify anybody with it. And you call him a wicked servant. Lord, we don't want to stand before you. And we don't want to be called a wicked servant. We want to use all of the gifts and the talents that you have given us. So, Father, that we can bring glory to your name. And, Lord, we know that someone else has something different than us. Help us to appreciate what each one brings to the table. Help us to appreciate what you have given uh, in the body. So, the Lord, that our bodies, church body, can operate 
in such a way, Lord, that it will be pleasing in your sight. The feet can't get envious over the hands. The hands can't get envious over the ears. You set everything in place so that the body, Lord, can do what it needs to do in order to function to bring glory to your name. Father, while we are praying, we still have some on our sick list. And we're praying, Father, that you continue to bless them in a special way. We're still praying for Reverend James and Connie Walker. Don't forget Sister Ruby Palmer. Don't forget Lord Sister Betty Brown. Don't forget Sister Ruth Askew, Sister Ethel Hill, Sister Barbara Harris. Uh, we're still praying for Brother Fox and family. Don't forget Brother Donald Moore and Sister Margaret Payne, Sister Hazel Hopkins and Brother Victor Hundley Jr., Sister Tucker, Brother Philip Maltrie, uh, Brother Leroy Harris, Deacon Dolores Holmes, and Sister Linda Howard, Sister Peggy Randall, Brother George Manning, uh, Deacon Benjamin Hundley and the Hurt family, Brother Ron and Beverly Hundley, Sister Juanita Farrell, Sister Ann Parker, Brother Julius Godwin. We're still praying for Sister Shirley Pryor, Brother Jack Lee, Brother Oliver Ruff, Brother George Washington, Sister Jasmine, Sister Annie Mae Davis. Lord, we're even praying for Kevin. Continue, Lord, to touch him. Touch Kevin right now, Lord, in the loss, I believe, of his aunt. And Lord, I may have missed somebody, but Lord, you know who they are. And at this time, we're going to call their names that I may have missed. Call their names right now. May. May McIntyre. John and Pat Griffith. Michelle, Michelle, and Michelle and Richard Richard London. Hunter. Brandon. William Brown, Louis Cooper, family. Hundley, Victor Hundley the third, Ethel Hill, oh, yes, Grace Stevenson, Marjorie, Van Fogarty, Ronald Hundley, Johnny Jackson, Ann Parker, Ed and Minnie Robinson, Linda Howard, Miss Arlene. Lord, you have heard the names that we have called. You know who they are. You know where they live. And you know what they stand in need of. We ask that you touch them in a special way. We ask, Father, that you lift them up. We ask, Father, that you just show yourself strong among your people. And we are praying, Father, those who are under the sound of my weak voice, that you bless them in their coming in and their going out and their uprising in their downsetting. Father, we praying right now that you will strengthen them. We praying right now that you will give them victory over all of these demonic spirits and spirits that are not of you. Give them the victory right now. Yes. Give First Baptist Church the victory right now. Yeah. Help us, Father, to, to have that one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one oh, baptism. Yeah. Lord, so that we might move as one church, one body, strong, yes. Lord, dressed in the armor of the Lord. Lord, that we might beat our enemy, yes. that we might put him under our feet and claim the victory. Remember our young people, wherever they may be going, wherever they may be living, touch them right now. And we ask these and all oh. blessings in our son Jesus' name. Yeah. And the people of God said, Amen. 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 Amen.